Good morning, Greece Campus once again. I want to welcome our church family watching at our other locations as well as our online viewers. We're glad that you guys are with us for the start of a brand new message series called When the Future Seems Un. <laughs> Uncertain when the future seems uncertain. Now, I don't know if you're like me or not, but when I'm face to face with uncertainty, I am certain I don't know what to do. I get stuck. Are you like that? Like when you don't know what to do, you tend to do nothing. Some people just get busy doing something, but I'm the opposite. I tend to freeze up. I become paralyzed because of an uncertain future. I get stressed and, and I get worried. And, and I like um, what our creative and uh, communications director, Chloe Smith, did with this design, the illustration, because we've all seen some of these neon signs that have run out of juice. And from a distance, it's hard to see what it even says. There's a lack of clarity. And then the image that she chose to put this sign slap dab against was a brick wall. And that just occurred to me, like, a lot of times in life when we face difficulties, it's really difficult to see the vision ahead. It often seems like we come up against a brick wall, that we're going against a dead end. Or maybe a better image to use would be like a dark alley where you can't see the next step in front of you, let alone where you're headed. And so that's why I think this, this series is going to be really, really important for us to, to consider over the next three weeks, we thought about going back into the book of Nehemiah. If you were part of our church before Easter, we spent about six or seven weeks in Nehemiah. And I just felt like, no, I think we need to talk about something different. Because we're all dealing with a lot of uncertainty in our own lives. We're dealing with some uncertainty in the church and uncertainty within the world. And it's what we do now that's going to make a difference in the stories that we tell in the future. Here's what got me thinking about this. Um, Bear with me, I'm going to get my phone. I don't know about you, but lately, occasionally in the past, you know, when I would check Facebook, I'd get these Facebook memories that would pop up. I know a lot of people are down on Facebook these days. I think that's one of the benefits and tools of Facebook, that it reminds me when people's birthdays are, for one, because I don't remember anybody's birthdays, but so I was like thankful for that. If we, get enough, if we get rid of Facebook in the future, can we at least have that feature so that we can remember whose birthdays are what days? The second feature is when, when something's happened in the past, maybe six, seven years ago, it reminds you of that moment, and you'll get a memory that pops up in, in the morning. It's kind of cool to look back on. Those are good memories. Well, recently, it hasn't been occasional. It's been more frequent, like every single morning almost, where I've, it happened this morning, where I get Facebook memories that pop up. And I thought, well, why is that? And then it occurred to me, and it was from a year ago. It occurred to me because none of us were doing anything a year ago. We were all stuck in our homes, under lockdown, in quarantine, couldn't go anywhere. So everybody and their mother was on Facebook posting something. I was posting some funny things about my kids. I was posting, you know, basketball drills. I was posting um, quotes from a book that I was reading. If you were here, part of our church at that time, we were doing a series called Anxious for Nothing. Uh, I read a, a great book by Max Lucada, so I was posting some things. And so it's like every single morning, I'm being reminded of something that happened a year ago in very difficult times. Around the same time when we were doing that Anxious for Nothing series, I encouraged our church to to do what the Apostle Paul did in difficult times when he faced anxiety and stressful situations. And he tells us to think about what is good and pure and lovely and excellent and praiseworthy. He says, consider these things. Think about such things so that we keep the main thing the main thing. And so what I did during that series is, just from a practical point of view, on my own computer I started to organize all the family photos that we had from years and years ago. I'm telling you, it took so long. I had a lot of time on my hands too, but it took me so long to get through all those photos. And maybe it's just me, but I had a lot of photos of food. Am I the only one that takes pictures of food? I was kind of embarrassed at myself, like, come on, Jeremy, get a life. Um, so I started deleting those pictures of my food, and, and it was just left with the most important pictures that I could look back on. And we started to have these family, like, viewings of our memories from years ago. And we were like, oh yeah, we remember that. I remember when that happened. I remember when little Jojo took a Sharpie to our wall. Yeah, I remember that. We still got the black marks on our wall. I remember these moments. And same thing with these Facebook memories that keep popping up. Every time I see something that happened a year ago in those difficult trials and those difficult moments that we all went through, I thought, I remember. 
I remember when. I remember when. And I had this thought. The stories that I'm telling now and the stories that you're remembering now were written then. That what we do in the moment determines what is told in the future. And that's the big idea for this series, and it's the big idea for today. And that is we need to live now for then. We need to live today for the day that's coming And even when we don't know what to do, the things that we do know what to do that we can have control over will actually have an influence in the days to come. So when the the future seems uncertain, what do you do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? That's what we're going to talk about in this series. I'm going to show you three things that you can do that God wants us to do as he's leading you to a preferred future, that vision that God has for us. Thank you. The vision that God has for us. And so just up front, I want to state very clearly the two goals for the next three weeks. The first one is this. I want you to hear God's vision for your life. I think too many people just kind of coast throughout life, not really understanding why they're here, why they exist, what God has for them, and where God's taking them. God is taking you to a destination. He is taking you to a preferred future. It's his preferred future, maybe not yours right now, but he wants you to have that same desire that he has, and he doesn't want to take you there kicking and screaming. He wants you to understand his vision for your life. And the second goal is that in the midst of uncertainty, I want you to be clear on what you can do now. And there's this great story in the New Testament that is going to help us with that in John chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 12. Before we read the first verse, i got to set up the context. Some of you are going to be very familiar with this story. You've heard it a lot. Some of you, might this might be brand new, so I want to make sure we're all on the same page. But the context of John chapter 12, you'd guess it would be John chapter 11, so you got to go back and look at what happens in the life of Jesus. Jesus has three specific friends that we're going to talk about, Mary, Martha, and a guy named Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus, the Bible tells us, got very sick, very ill, and... His sisters, Mary and Martha, were concerned about his health, and so they send word to Jesus because if they think that if we can get Jesus to come into this situation, then Jesus can do what Jesus does best, and he'll heal Lazarus. And so that's their, their plan. And there's this great verse in John chapter 11, verse 5, that I want to read to you to kind of set up our time together. It says this. Maybe you can relate to this. Verse 5 says in John chapter 11, Now Jesus loved Martha... And her sister, Mary, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, stop right there. If you were writing this gospel, or you were anticipating what would be said next in this gospel, how would you fill in the next sentence? Think about that. Jesus loved Martha, loved Mary, loved Lazarus. Jesus knew that Lazarus was very ill. So put two and two together, that we have an all-loving and all-knowing God. And so if God is all-loving and all-knowing, and if Jesus loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Jesus is aware that Lazarus is ill, I would expect, if I were writing the story, that the next phrase would be, so Jesus came as fast as he could and stepped into the situation and did what he does best. He healed Lazarus. That would be a great story, wouldn't it? And yet, that's not a story. The Bible says this. Go ahead and put that on the screen there. He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. It seems to me as I read that, that Jesus made a very intentional decision. And the decision was this. I'm going to stay put on purpose. I'm going to stay put on purpose. But, but Jesus, I thought you loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I do. Jesus, I thought you were aware that Lazarus is kind of in need right now. I am. But I'm going to stay here on purpose. And the reason why I'm going to stay put on purpose is because I have a greater purpose that you might not be aware of. And I need you to trust me that I see much more of this picture than you do. Well, you can say amen all, the, all you want right now, but they weren't saying amen to that. Here's what Martha 
was saying. Verse 21 of John chapter 11. She gets word that Jesus shows up after the fact. Jesus is in town after the fact. Can I just point out, Jesus wasn't even at the funeral. This is four days after Lazarus has been in the tomb. And when you've been in the tomb for four days, you are dead. (laughs) You don't even need a death certificate. You're dead. There's no hope for you. And so Martha hears that Jesus is in town, and Martha goes out to meet Jesus. And she makes this statement that behind the statement is almost a question. It's a question of pain. It's a question of trust. It's a discouragement. She says these words, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You ever make a similar statement in your own life where God did not act and move on your timeline? And you essentially say to him, Lord, if you had been here, I wouldn't be going through this difficulty. Lord, if you had been here, I wouldn't be going through this pain that I'm in. Lord, if you had been here, this would have worked out better. Lord, if you had been here, there would have been healing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. There's a lot of pain in that statement. In fact, it's not just Martha, it's Mary that says the exact same phrase. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then if you keep reading in John chapter 11, which I'd encourage you to do on your own time after the service, um, Jesus prays this amazing prayer to his father. And he says the famous statement that we looked at last week in our Easter service. He says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who dies, if he believes, shall not die, he shall live. And then he asks the question, you remember it? He said, do you believe this? And Martha in the midst of her pain, expresses faith in who Jesus is, and she says, yes, yes. And then Jesus does something amazing. He looks at the tomb of Lazarus, and he reveals the greater purpose that he had in that situation. When he chose, days later, to stay put on purpose, he looks at the tomb, and he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, you got to imagine this scene. He comes out with grave clothes and all, a cloth on his head, and everybody is astonished. They just made it out of the hardest days of their life. They were on this side of hope, and God had brought them through to the other side of hope. And they experienced with Jesus hope in the midst of their pain, hope in the midst of their difficulty. And if I was writing the story, I'd be like, the end, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived a long, happy life. Nothing like this ever happened again to them. But that's not the end of the story either. If you keep reading in John chapter 11, you'll realize that that was the exact moment, the critical factor and trigger that set off these Jewish leaders to want to arrest Jesus and put him to death. And the reason why they wanted to arrest Jesus and put him to death was because Rome would get wind of what Jesus had done through this resurrection of Lazarus. The Jewish leaders were already concerned about Jesus' signs, wonders, and miracles. And the pinnacle of sign, wonders, and miracles is a resurrection. When you can rise someone from the dead, someone's going to get wind of that. And they were afraid that the Romans were going to come in and dismantle everything that they had built. And so what did they do? Caiaphas makes this statement that he didn't realize was a prophecy that God was using because he was the high priest. He said, why would a whole nation suffer if we could give up one man? One man will die for our nation, and that's exactly what he did. One man in place of one nation. One man in place of all of us. He hung on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And so they say, here you go. Take him, leave us alone. And they plotted from that point forward to not only arrest Jesus, but to kill Jesus. Now, if Jesus is arrested and Jesus is killed, you better believe that his disciples' life is at risk as well, including Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Why do I say all this? Why did I just tell you that the Lord brought them through the hardest days of their life only to face an uncertain future? It's because I want that weight to sit on you 
for the remainder of this message. I want that reality to sit in you for the remainder of this series. Because when you are faced with an uncertain future, what we're about to read in John chapter 12 will tell us what we can do when we don't know what to do. And if we will do these three things that we're going to talk about over the next several weeks, we will have some amazing stories to tell when God takes us to that destination where he's bringing us. So John chapter 12, verse 1, here's what the Bible says. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was. I love how John just puts this in there. Whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Um, you might get him confused with some other Lazarus. Maybe that's a common name back then. But this is the same guy that was dead a few days ago. This is the same guy, okay? Which is why I think we read the very next verse of the setting of this scene. They were at a dinner. They gave a dinner for him there. Another translation says they gave a dinner in honor of Jesus. So this wasn't just a casual dinner where they got together. They were hungry. They needed food. This was a specific planned out dinner. And they prepared it so that Jesus would be honored. We don't know if there were speeches at this dinner or not. But it was prepared for a specific purpose so that Jesus would be honored for late raising Lazarus from the dead. And it's obviously hosted at Mary and Martha's house, and so they're preparing this meal, and they want to make sure that Jesus is being honored in this dinner. And i got to imagine this scene right here. Someone at the dinner must have been thinking, this is weird, because I was just at the funeral of this guy who's sitting across the table from me, and now he's talking to Jesus at this dinner party. He's the one thanking Jesus. Jesus literally raised a dead man to life to have dinner with him. And I think if John was here as he was writing this gospel, maybe he had glimpses of us too, and he would want us to hear this message, that this is where we're headed. We will die, we will rise, and we will be sitting at the dinner table of Jesus celebrating the name that is above every name. That is the vision for your life. Jesus wants to take you to heaven, and he doesn't want to drag you to heaven. He wants you to be rested as you get to heaven. And he wants to make you more like Jesus as you get to heaven. That's his vision for your life. And so this is a picture of where we're headed. But what do we do in the meantime? Because their problems didn't go away. And this is where we learn the first thing that we can do when we don't know what to do. It's verse 2. So they gave a dinner for him there. And I want to focus on these next two words. Martha served. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Martha served. Now, that's not anything new. If you know anything about Martha's personality, if you read other parts of the, the Gospels, like in Luke chapter 11, Martha was always the one serving. She was a busy body. That's what she did. I, I think that was kind of a part of her personality. And you don't even have to be a woman to relate to Martha in this story. Guys, if you're a type A driven personality uh, like myself, you're always trying to be busy setting goals. You're always trying to do something in life. You don't even need to be type A. You can be type B. And um, you, you can have some of these issues as well, always trying to be busy, always doing something with your hands. Maybe you struggle with ADHD. You always got to find something to do with your hands. Guys, I know there's always something to do in the garage. You're just trying to stay busy. You're a busy body. Women, you can probably relate to this. There's always something to do at the house. There's always something to clean. There's always some place to take the kids, another practice, another concert. Always staying busy. So this wasn't anything new for Martha, but what was new for Martha was because, is that she had a different vantage point now. I'm imagining Martha at this dinner as she's looking over and seeing her brother who a few days before that was dead in a tomb. You think she was serving the same way as before? I'm imagining she takes up the broom and she's not just, you know, serving. She's serving. She's got a different motivation. She's got a different appreciation. She's got a different vantage point. She's got a different level of gratitude in her heart because of what Jesus has done for us. Isn't that true that when we go through the difficulties of life, the Lord uses those difficulties in a way that changes our perspective on life, including when we serve other people? That's what hardships do. Hardships and difficulties, when we walk through those uncertain times, they have a way of changing our perspective when we walk through those difficulties with Jesus. It's one thing to know about Jesus when you read about him in the Bible. It's another thing to experience Jesus when you witness him 
being faithful in your difficulties. It's one thing to know that John chapter 16, verse 13, I think it says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. It's one thing to know that the Bible says that Jesus will be with you in trouble. It's another thing to know that Jesus has walked with you through that trouble. That it's actually through hardships that hearts change. That's typically how God molds you into the person that he's created you to be. Um, I was thinking about Aaron's grandmother, actually, um, who's up in a nursing home here in Rochester. She had a stroke a few years back, but she's, she's lived through difficulty. She's lived through hardships, and God has used those hardships to change her. Um, when they were around 59 years old, your grandfather died, right, of leukemia, and uh, her husband, she lost her husband, and she learned to love even through those hardships. She's been a widow now for three decades almost. It's amazing to think about. But it's clear that God has used those difficulties in her life to lead her closer to Jesus in a way that she would have never have had that happen to her in her life without those hardships. It's the same story of the, the New Testament writers. You think about James, the, the half-brother of Jesus. He says this in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. By the way, he was martyred for his faith. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But literally, trials that we go through, an uncertain future, difficulties that we go through, that it makes it very difficult to see where God's taking us. God uses those in a way that builds in us sanctification to become more like Jesus. Paul, who had plenty of persecution, Plenty of hardships in his life. He says this in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What makes Martha's story so unique is not that she was serving. What makes it so unique is that she was serving on the other side of hope. What makes her story so significant is that she learned through the difficulties of life to serve, I believe, with a greater perspective because of what Jesus has taken her through. She literally just walked through the hardest days of her life. And as a result of that, she had a different perspective on life. Now, I kind of think that Martha has a little bit of a competitive advantage. She saw a physical resurrection. I didn't, <laughs> and you didn't. I mean, I'm grateful to have the Bible that tells me about that physical resurrection, but I'm not doubting Thomas. I didn't have the privilege of touching Jesus' pierced hands and, and feet and touching a physical body and seeing an actual resurrection like Martha did and the disciples did. But yet, can I remind us that at this dinner table was not just one guy who would rise from the dead, but two. It wasn't just her brother that rose from the dead, it would be her soon-to-be Savior, Jesus, who, by the way, we have the same privilege of seeing that vantage point because we, as we looked at last week, are certain of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so since we have reason for the hope that we have, we also have the vantage point of Martha, and we can serve through difficulties with a higher degree of appreciation and gratitude rather than just do it because we have to. We do it because we want to, because it's an act of worship. And so because you've walked through, perhaps some of you, we've all walked through the most difficult days of our life, at least to this point, and perhaps we might walk through some of the most difficult days of our life to come, especially if you're younger. When God brings us through those difficulties, even when we're faced with an uncertain future, we can be certain of what he's promised us in the future, that we have experienced a resurrection. We are redeemed people. We are forgiven people. We are forgiven of a past that no one want, we don't want anybody to know about. We have been set upon a rock, and God lifts our eyes to a preferred future where he's taken us 
And he asks us, because of that, we want to serve with hope. We want to be dispensers of that hope, just like these disciples were. There's this um, story a lady shared with us. She's been asking for prayer on our prayer chain for the last several weeks. Um, I won't use any names, but she gave me permission to share this story. They've been praying for her mother-in-law who had heart issues. And she was going to go into uh, surgery. Actually, she went into surgery Friday, but they were very worried that she wouldn't make it out of surgery because of her heart issues, and she did not know Jesus. And so the weeks leading up to this, this daughter-in-law had been praying for her mother-in-law who didn't know Jesus, who was very sick, and she just kept encouraging her, sharing prayers with her, sharing scripture with her. I, I would say from my vantage point, she was sharing and serving like it depended on her, but boy, was she ever praying like it depended on God. She knew that she couldn't change this lady's heart, but she just wanted to do everything that she possibly could with greater intentionality because of the moment. And so last week, her um, husband, this lady who shared the prayer request on the prayer chain, her husband, who's the son of this mother, the elderly mother who's sick, he came home from church and called his mom and uh, wanted to talk to her specifically about salvation. Wanted to share the hope, the reason for the hope that he had. And her first response was, I I just need to get my will ready because I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. And to which he replied, Mom, I'm talking about heaven or hell. Where would you go if you left this earth this Friday? I mean, very intentional, very, very direct with her. And they had a good conversation. Nothing really happened at that point. Two days later, he got a phone call from his mom who said, that I got down on my knees and I prayed to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. And this lady who shared this prayer request, she adds this, you have to realize this, this lady, this mom, left her husband, the son, when he was a child with her stepdad who abused him for his whole childhood. And the mom made the statement to the son to the effect that she said, I don't think I'm worthy to be saved. This lady said, "For, for a lady that has lived a destructive life, this is huge. It's a start. It's a reminder, she said, that none of us are perfect and we all need the grace of God. And in that moment, this lady got the grace of God. Church family, that is huge for them because it's huge for us. She says, I will continue to step out in my faith and do my part. I'm thankful for you guys. This was huge for our family. And the reason why it's huge for our family of God is because one day that lady will be sitting at the dinner table with Jesus, celebrating the name that is above every name. And you know what she's going to do? Facebook's going to pop up. I don't think we'll have Facebook in heaven. I sure hope not. But a memory's going to pop up. And she's going to remember her daughter-in-law, who encouraged, who shared, who served her when she least expected it and least deserved it. She's going to remember her son, who had the courage enough to have the difficult conversation to share the message of the gospel with her and actually call her to repentance and to believe in Jesus as her Savior. And she's going to have a really good story to share because of what happened now. Are you living now? Are you serving the way Martha served with a greater perspective of a resurrection now so that the stories that are told then you'll be blessed with? you'll be happy with, and you'll be able to celebrate the goodness of God. I want to invite our worship teams to come forward as we uh, close our worship service. Um, Pastor Tim, if you want to come up, let me pray for us. God, I pray that the realization of a resurrection, just as Mary and Martha experienced on that week, that day, would be real to us. I pray that you would not allow us to just go through life casually forgetting of the opportunity that we have each and every day to serve you 
and to be dispensers of hope to a generation that does not know you. God, people need this hope. And just like Martha, we have this hope of the resurrection. God, if I'm honest, there's days where I'm so tired, I don't even, I don't have enough energy to keep doing what you've called us to do. So I pray that you would renew us, renew our spirits, get our eyes up on the vision that you've called us to do and help us serve from a different perspective, the perspective of Martha. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this, amen.